My name is Rob Usiskin. I worked for three years as a mechanical engineer on the rover that just landed on Mars, uh, and I'm now finishing up a PhD in material science here at Caltech. Thank you. Yeah. I want to show you an experiment. Maybe some of you can guess what this is. Yeah. This is dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. Right? It's extremely cold, and people will tell you not to touch it with your bare hands, and that's probably good advice. But you can get away with it if you kind of bobble it like a hot potato, and if you're a little daring, you can even do this. Okay. Don't bite it, don't swallow it, okay? You'll really hurt yourself. So we call it dry ice because when you heat it up, it sublimes. It converts from a solid directly into a gas. Right? There's no liquid, so we say it's dry ice. All right, so now I'm going to pour water on the dry ice. So what's going on here? What is this white stuff? Where did that come from? Well, it doesn't seem like a liquid, right? Because if it were a liquid, it would kind of pool at the bottom, where it's sort of billowing around, right? It's floating around here. And it doesn't seem like carbon dioxide gas, because that's invisible. We breathe that out. That's in the room all around us. You can't see it. And it's not water vapor, because we breathe that out. That's in the room all around us, and that's invisible. So what the heck is this white stuff? Well, the, 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 uh, the key is that air has this property that when you heat it up, that it, let me say, air has this property that it can only hold so much water vapor. Right? It can't hold an infinite amount. And when you heat it up, it can hold more. When you cool it down, it can't hold as much. So here, I poured water onto the dry ice, and the dry ice sublimed cold carbon dioxide gas, which filled up this tank. And it cooled, that CO2 cooled down the air that was in the tank. All right? Now the air can't hold the water vapor that it had from just in being in the room around it. And the water vapor had to condense into liquid. And it happened all at once, all around the tank. The water vapor condenses into millions of tiny liquid droplets that are so small that they stay suspended in the gas. Okay? They don't settle but they're big enough to scatter light. So when we look at it, we see something opaque. We see white, we see white stuff. Right? The technical term for this is an aerosol. Liquid droplets that are so small that they stay suspended in the gas. That's an aerosol. But there's a more common word. We call it a cloud. Right? This is where clouds come from. And that explains a lot. Right? It explains, for example, why clouds are so common in our world. Right? To make a cloud, all you need is moist air that you cool down enough that now the air can't hold all that water vapor, and some of it has to condense into these liquid droplets. It also explains, for example, on a cold day, if it's a little bit humid out, you can see your breath. Right? <sighs> That's the same thing. Moist air from your lungs comes out, and it gets cooled down very quickly by the cold air, and now that, that breath can't hold that water vapor you just breathed out, condenses into little liquid droplets. In other words, on a cold day, if it's a little humid out, you can breathe clouds. <laughs> Let me show you one other part of the experiment here. This is a kid's toy that blows bubbles. <laughs> Takes a second just to get going here. <laughs> All right, so I hope you can see that the bubbles float in the tank but sink everywhere else. Why? What's going on with that? Well, it turns out there's a general principle that less dense things float on top of more dense things. And here, we've now filled this tank with carbon dioxide, which is more dense than air. So carbon dioxide stays in the tank. And when I blow these, these air bubbles, air is less dense than carbon dioxide, and they float on top. 
We can even, we can even kind of slosh it around like this. So why is this appealing? I think there's something instinctively fun and appealing about this. Why? What's cool about this? Right? So one thing is it's surprising. Right? It looks like a magic potion, right? It's unexpected. This is pretty, I think. Bubbles are pretty. And clouds, swirling clouds are pretty. And there's also a deeper sense of pretty when we see the patterns in the world. Right? The connection between our breath and the clouds. It's a pretty idea. This is smart. Right? You do experiments like this, and you get answers about how the world works. And if you're careful, more often than not, your answers are actually right. right? This is important, because having answers about how clouds work tell us about when rain will occur, or when droughts will happen, how hurricanes behave. And this is challenging. right? When you don't know, you look at this white stuff, and you say, what the heck is this? It's like a mystery, a detective game. Right? How can you figure it out? Can you use a magnifying glass? Sherlock Holmes? Maybe you need a microscope? Let's see if we can do this. And this is playful. Right? To do this demo, right, I needed a fish tank, dry ice, and this bubble shooter. <laughs> right? And if you become a scientist, they actually pay you to do stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to play with other people, too. You know, if this were an experiment at Caltech, there would probably be somebody from a foreign country there, and they would probably have an accent. <laughs> they would probably, and maybe instead of saying bubbles, maybe they would say boobles. <laughs> right? And, and then maybe I would start to joke, hey, guys, do you like my boobles? <laughs> and then a girl over here on our team would say, I used to have no boobles, but now I have big boobles. <laughs> right? And in the middle of a serious, important science experiment, we would stop for a minute and have a completely ridiculous conversation about how big all of our boobles are. <laughs> you know, some people think that science is only appealing to men or to nerds or to people who wear glasses. But I think science is appealing for human reasons. Right? You can be a mom and like surprises. You can be a lawyer and like pretty ideas and pretty swirling clouds. You can have light skin or dark skin and think that swirling clouds look like magic and that the explanation behind it is smart. And you can believe in one god or 40 gods, or you can be happily godless, and you can be five years old or 30 years old or 80 years old. And you can be an artist, an athlete, a jock, a dancer, or a little bit of all those things. And because you're human, still like that science is surprising and pretty and smart and important and challenging and playful and cool. And that's why I do it. Thank you. <laughs>